Hello and welcome to Pelicar. This is Nuts and Bolts, episode 16. This is the show where we talk about fantasy world building as it pertains to RPG storytelling and the realm of Pelicar in particular. Well, usually, today, we're going to try something new. This is our first blank page build. I've been world building for about 35 years. During most of that time, I've been involved in gaming of one sort or another. I've run some great campaigns. I've done some writing and published a few things. I have a degree in history from Oklahoma State University. Now I lurk on Reddit and Facebook, coiled and ready to strike with unexpected advice. I've been self-employed, and I've worked for the man. Does this wealth of life experience make me an expert? In some cases, I'm confident I can say yes. In others, not so much. However, today, we're talking about world building, and this is one matter in which you can trust me. This is exercise one in world building from scratch. We're going to start with a blank piece of paper and fill it up with something wonderful. I'll tell you right now, most of what you're going to see, it's nothing new. I'm putting a bunch of old ideas into a new presentation, and that's the entertainment value. If I can add just 5% to your world building acumen, I'm doing pretty dadgum good and I'm happy about it. A warning, I started in the days before fancy software or even fancy computers, but the principle is the same. It's just the aesthetics. So, if you can tolerate my scribbles, let's get started. Since this is our first exercise, we'll start small. Maybe a place where your audience, players, or readers can get a little taste for your world. We're going to make it isolated, but not entirely cut off. Sizable, but not overwhelming. We'll create our scale about 50 miles for an inch. And I do mean about. Let your audience know this isn't a map created by GPS satellites. It's the best some dude with a parchment and a pair of feet could do for them. I like 50 miles because if you're really hauling ass, it's a day's travel. We're talking a good road, fresh horses, experienced rider. The same distance is reasonable to call normal for two days, and you can scale it up from there. Pretty easy. Moving to our next phase, let's get some boundaries down. We'll start with a mountain range across the top of the map. If you're not an artist, it's okay. It's the functionality of it that all counts. Now, let's see about throwing a volcano in there just for fun. It'll be a good story for later, right? Something to build on. Now how about something over on the east side of the map? Let's put that blue pencil to work. How about a river? Big old sloppy watershed. It's going to determine a lot of things for our region. Uh, for now, it's just a boundary. Something pure and simple. Across the bottom, what's better boundary than a coast? We're just going to draw a crooked line across. We're not going to worry about the details too much. What's important is that you are framing the area that you're really interested in working on. So, in the west, we're going to put in a highlands area, uh, something with some inclimactic weather and terrain, and another great boundary, the swamp. We're never going to detail that exterior. We are only interested on the inside. That is where the adventure will lie. Which brings us to working on that interior. Let's add some rivers. Put hills where the rivers indicate there should be high ground. Of course, in reality, it works the other way. But for map making purposes, you can do what you need to. Now that's a little bit sloppy, but it does get the point across. And that's the only thing that matters. What about home base? Uh, let's see. We're going to need another river and a dot. And just like that. The town of Journey Mills is born. Now let's think a little bit about history. How did Journey Mills get to where it is today? So we're going to put some folks over here on this river. This is a good place for a big city, one of the bigger ones in the region. We're going to call these guys the Carib Hegemony. Basically, a bunch of city-states and some trade guilds. To the north, past the mountains, is the Crystal Kingdoms. And they're the ones that settled Journey Mills. The two fought a war about 20 years ago. And part of the peace deal was that Journey Mills should be disavowed to become a buffer zone between the two great powers. The Carib hegemony hoped it would die. 
but it didn't. Why not? Let's give it some reasons to live. That means economy, and the back of any economy, is great natural resources. I'm thinking those hills look pretty good for gold deposits. We'll put some mineable coal to the southeast, and since I want this land to be forested, we'll add pelts and lumber to the exportable goods list. Reason number two for survival is a concentration of fighting power. Journey Mills has a population of 5,000. Most of that is wrapped up into 18 great houses, primarily the remnants of the original fighting teams who founded the city over 40 years ago. Monsters in the woods, mountains, and swamps have kept the adventuring tradition strong. Journey Mills partially got its name from the number of small lumber mills in the area, and there is a tannery downstream. They have a lot of leveled folks, and they also have some very skilled artisans. As finished goods go, they export high-end jewelry, furniture, fur coats, and leather goods. Trade routes out of the small city follow forest roads linking up to both their major neighbors and to a small anchorage to the south, where ore-driven longboats ferry cargo out to trading vessels. Now it's time to check off some boxes. Government. How about an oligarchy of the strong? The town is run by a council of representatives appointed by the households. The council generally maintains oversight, but lets a triumvirate of bishop, mayor, and trade master run things on a day-to-day -day basis. The bishop, being currently the most politically motivated priest in town. Next up, weather. Southerly rains will keep the area wet and allow for some nice storms coming off the water in the south. Temperatures are kind of a northern temperate. Let's say snow cover through January with a few lows in the north around minus 40 Celsius and summer highs occasionally reaching 35 degrees. Big snow dumps are possible late in the fall and early in the spring, amounting to a couple of feet or more in a week. Southern summers can see many cyclones and high winds. Speaking of ethnicity, it's on the cool side of things, so let's make the rule fair skin with some blonde hair thrown in. We'll have us some humans, a healthy number of elves, some brownies, sub in the equivalent of your halfling, and last, monkey, or your favorite tree-dwelling race. For our primary elves, we'll make them short and thin-faced, a little darker than the humans. Our brownies will be thicker than most, with blonde hair, that leaves the monkey to be lemur-like, with long, fluffy tails alternating between light brown and white fur. Most of these people have roots in the Crystal Kingdoms, but the group above is about 80% of the population. There are members of a lot of different peoples mixed in, from the East and the South. Now one of my favorites, marriage customs. I like going a little non-conventional for my world, so let's try something new. We'll make monogamous boy-girl marriages the norm, but with a caveat. Widows and widowers are often taken as a second spouse by dominant, well-positioned in-laws. Going a step farther, a few outliers will sometimes take on the older siblings of the spouse who simply never got married. You may have lost a brother, but you just brought his whole family into your marriage. My viewpoint aside... Any creator should definitely take on sensitive subject matter and adopt it to what they and their target audience is comfortable with. What am I comfortable with? How about work ethic and career paths? The lumber mills and tannery are the big employers of journey mills. That's where most residents go to take their early jobs. This is something of a coming-of-age tradition. It sees most men and a lot of women leaving home to live in the shop barracks. It would be nearly impossible to excel as an adult without joining this process. This is where lifelong friends are made and careers begun. Adventurous sorts often end up in wilderness camps, an accepted equivalent to the laborers' barracks. Many of these camps have populations numbering into the hundreds. They are sometimes temporary and last only a few years. They support gold miners, trappers, hunters, and loggers. Young fighting teams almost always spring up from these well-armed camps. After years in the barracks, usually five to ten, 
The denizens of Journey Mills move to the next stage of their lives. This means taking over family shops or taking on more advanced apprenticeships. It might mean traveling abroad to serve in merchant caravans or to fight as mercenaries. Many will marry. Most hunker down for what will be long, boring lives. Our next box to check off isn't boring at all. What makes Journey Mills look different from any other town? The bottom line? The spoils of mining. The gold is not so prevalent to turn Journey Mills into a metropolis. Every five years or so, a big find will bring in new residents. But when it's done, the town always seems to find its way back down to 5,000 or so happy souls. Gold is found with quartz, and sometimes large crystal formations are just as precious as the metal. Journey Mills is home to a number of large crystals found over the years to decorate the city. One spiring crystal is mounted in front of the city courthouse. Another is the center of the city's biggest intersection. Most houses have smaller crystals displayed in front of their homes or in sitting rooms. What about flora and fauna? Plant life is very much earth norms. The undergrowth is not particularly heavy, and trees are a mix of evergreens and deciduous. Maples, spruce, fir, and pine are most common. Ferns, some over six feet, are not unusual. Areas of moss can be found in the hills, but occasionally dry summers and bitter cold winters keep it from spreading wildly. Animal types are mostly mammals, with some reptiles along the coast. Endland species include bears, deer, moose, possum, skunk, rabbit, wolves, and beaver. This is not an exhaustive list. Giantized forms of several of these animal types are somewhat common. The greater white-tailed squirrel can be found in specimens reaching six feet at the shoulders. And just about as common as bears are possums the size of big old bears. When it comes to monsters, there is a fair share. Corrupted winter spirits will possess those bears in the north, creating an abomination referred to locally as winter hellions. Every few years, they sweep down in packs and are a threat to the common folk and low-level adventurers. Once a decade or so, they are organized by snow butchers, effectively demon snowmen. These dangerous creatures are generally in the 8th to ninth level range, possessing magical cold attacks. On a day-to-day -day basis, there are plenty of opportunities for low-level fighting teams, but escalating the risks of the region is easy enough. White dragons or winter wyverns may roost in the north. Sea monsters are sure to roam the oceans of the south. It is beyond the purview of nuts and bolts to go into the minutiae of your world's monster manual. There is easily enough space in the region for a hundred dungeons or massive cave systems. It's isolated enough for clever monsters to hide and dumb ones to roam, yet with just enough civilization to toy with urban campaigning on the side. Chapter 11. What are some of the coolest aspects of the Journey Mills region? We're going to go through these landmarks kind of quick. You can add details that fit into your own world building or campaign style, or someday I might expand this into a document put it behind a paywall, make you pay for the good stuff. Number one, the Monastery of Bone. You could base this place on any number of nature, ocean, hunting, or sailing religions. What it amounts to is a bastion in the middle of the Bleak Highland, a great structure constructed almost entirely of whale bones. It is occupied by the Order of the Horn. You can make them druids, wardens, Monks, fighter clerics, or whatever works for your system. They're scholars, rarely seeking conflict. Once a year, they make the pilgrimage south to the sea and go whaling in the oceans along the coast. Number 7. Harmonious Gulch This deep, thin, river-carved gulch is an outlier of the vast quartz caverns the area is known for. Though beautiful, they are relatively worthless in the region. They are still occasionally harvested for choice samples that can be exported south. Several points of the rift are situated such that the sun's light will be amplified to such a degree to effectively cause whiteout. Number 8. 
the Muddy Hills. This strange region is geologically unique. It's a landscape of bubbles. Hot water comes to the surface, combining with the unusual soil structure to create giant hills of mud and muck. Sometimes they pop. They are very nearly impassable on the ground and devoid of vegetation. Number 9. One of the great undeveloped potentials of the region is known as Seabone Beach. The natural harbor is protected by a vibrant coral reef. There is good coastal fishing, and stormy seas keep other nations from taking advantage. There is plenty of timber within five miles to build a small fishing fleet. If a port is ever built, it could serve as a safe harbor for ocean-going vessels poised to take advantage of the southern trade zones. At number 10 sits Cackle's Tower. Strangely tall and frightfully thin, the tower climbs above the surrounding forest and hills. At 400 feet, it's one of the tallest man-made structures for a thousand miles. The unsettling tower is easy to see at a distance and disconcerting to observe, as its exact location is obscured by some strange magic. Setting a course by sight seems like a sure thing, but she'll skip and jump at you at the slightest blink of an eye. Across the landscape, as the traveler moves closer, you'll get there, but it's not going to be a direct route. What lies inside the tower is surely a mystery your characters will one day need to explore. Last on our featured list of landmarks, the Turtle Hills. South of the coal pits, the gentle hills run right against the seashore. It's a nice enough spot, but what it's known for is the turtles coming up to nest in the spring and hatch in the fall. Some of these turtles are very large, up to 10 feet across. It's a must visit for any lover of nature or turtle meat. Now, with a little imagination, we could go on forever. We could talk about Fern Valley, where the plant life grows tall. We could talk about the sorrow fields where men were laid low during the war that made this area independent. But we won't. Eventually, all things must come to an end. But not this episode. We've still got stuff to talk about. Next up, religion. Everyone's journey is different, and Journey Mills is no different. Well, I mean, because it's the same. Because it, it's the same because it's different, because they're all different. But, okay, what I'm trying to say is, you guys all have your own religious systems, and various ways of handling spiritual matters. So, take this for what it's worth. In my Journey Mills, they are not a particularly churchy people. With a choice of religious pantheons, They've nitpicked what works for them. Further, they do just enough to keep the churches they do have satisfied and the gods they represent content. For the sake of their adventuring tradition, they've erected a monument of the northern god of wealth and fame. Because there is a nearby ocean affecting their weather, they pray twice a year at the temple of some god of the sea and storms. Trade is important. So the town's gates are incorporated as temples to the eastern god of commerce. Those are the big three, still leaving room for a few more. They have a couple of small churches devoted to two different death deities. However, nobody pays a whole lot of attention to them unless somebody important dies. Finally, the hunters and trappers maintain a church to a foreign god of the hunt just outside of town. Well, that really is just about going to do it. So how did I do? Let me know in the comments. Tell me what you think. Has it been helpful? Did I leave something out? I mean, after all, you can only fit so much into a reasonably timed YouTube video. Now, before we go, let's talk about copyrights for just a second. I don't normally do this, but I think it's more relevant than usual. As a matter of course, everything on the station is mine, and I'm not releasing any copyrights. However, this episode is intended to inspire. I'm not going to object if you adapt concepts of this episode to your world, even if you're planning on making a little money off of it. Change it up, mold it to your vision, and give me a little line of credit in the fine print. None of that's a violation of copyright law anyway. However, if you copy me verbatim, for profit, in the public eye, I'm going to have an issue. 
Don't steal it. Be inspired. Well, that's going to do it, my fellow adventurers. Don't forget to check out Season 2 of Dresden's Tale. My ability to produce the story has improved tremendously. I will almost certainly win an Emmy, or a Dundee, or something like that, for my voice acting this year. Hit that like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. Tell your friends. But most of all, thank you for stopping by. My name is Lewis Nichols, and I hope you all have an absolutely wonderful day. Appendix A. A thousand things to keep a fighting team busy, all in one long, brutal take. Level 1. Are the sea hags back? Scout down the river to investigate. Are there bears on the road? Somebody's going to have to deal with them. Mad dogs. Clean up the wild canines at the city's edges. Gets me some obsidian. A trip to the volcano for the town alchemist. Find the monster. A gold shaft release, releases a nasty beast. Question the travelers. Investigate foreigners, foreigners reported on the northern highway. Develop Seabone Beach. Mission 1. Gather some coral for the town alchemist. What do you do when you hit level 3? Anything can escalate. Fight the sea hags. The bears are mutating. The mad dogs have gotten meaner. Back to Seabone Beach. Stay with a temporary camp for a month. Make an alliance with a forest wyvern. Break up a slaver's outpost. Then comes level five. Take a mutated dog back to the big city for analysis. Mutagenic cult revealed. Escort builders to Seabone Beach. Find out who's facilitating the slave ring in Journey Mills. Make contact with the dragon in the mountains. Take a pack. Take on a pack of winter hellions. Trek to the swamp. Suppress the muckabucks. Fire on the hill. Investigate strange religious events out in the wilderness. Soon comes level seven. Showdown with the slavers. Showdown with the mutagenics. Is it just another hole in the ground? Dungeon crawl gets deep. Then, there's rumors of war. Escort traders to the far east to gather information. A giant must be dealt with. Call for aid. Help the monastery with a problem in the highlands. Placation. Get the MacGuffin to appease powerful forces. Doesn't matter what the powerful forces are. Just get the damn MacGuffin. Now we're level 9. As an unintended show of force, city comes under attack by a powerful creature, PCs called out as heroes. Back to Bone Beach, investigators being sought for a new colony. Seduction, pretty foreigner seduces a PC. It's love, but with strings attached. A devil in the north, squash another cult before the evil beast breaks through. A sage for hire. Sage, selling the sight of locations of powerful magic. What do you do when you get to level 11? There's an assassination attempt. Old enemies come hunting for revenge. Bone Beach, it needs a port. Travel the seas, hunting pirates. New gold strike, protected by a metallic wyvern that must be dealt with. Woo! No, Woo! New trade partners. The spice must flow. Uh, Appendix 2. So this last little bit is also unscripted. We're going to just try to do a little one-on-one -on -one stuff here. I wanted to kind of explain the reasoning behind why I'm doing this kind of video, and hopefully we'll do more in the future. This also relates to some of my other uh, world-building episodes that I have planned. Uh, the stuff that's out there, there's a lot of world building content available on YouTube and other platforms, but from what I have found, a lot of it is either so vague and so general that it has no application to actually doing something functional, or it is just about how some big high budget movie, uh, or popular book did what they did. 
uh, I mean, I, I love the, the lore and everything of, of, uh, Tolkien and, uh, Lord of the Ring, well, Lord of the Rings, Tolkien, um, Game of Thrones, uh, the sci-fi stuff, the gaming, Skyrim, I mean, all that is just cool. It's fun. It's fun to get into it. But we're here to help each other work on our own stuff. And that's what I hope to do by giving very specific examples. So, a little bit about my method and my production here, how I, I did this episode. The initial script was pretty simple, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is the original map you're looking at, and what I did was uh, scripted as I created the map. Uh, kind of similar to what you saw, except it was a lot smoother, a lot easier, because I didn't have to worry about the technical stuff early on. Uh, the whole thing was only about a three-hour process. Part of this is because of practice. I've been doing this kind of thing for a while. I run mental exercises just, just for fun when driving. I mean, the world building aspects, the, okay, what can I come up with a new idea? You know, I try to challenge myself that way. It's, it's entertainment to me. Um, the other reason, well, well, and over that time, it, I've built up a checklist mentally of things that I can use a a bucket of parts, basically, that I can draw from and assemble. The other thing is, and if there's a lesson here, this is it, I guess. Uh, I don't sweat the details. I don't worry about little things. And the reason is, nobody cares. Don't worry about picking the perfect name. It'll grow on you. It'll grow on your character, on your audience. And if you're working along the project and find out it's not working, then you can change it later. But it took me a second and a half to come up with Journey Mills. The same thing with naming stuff like uh, the Crystal Kingdoms and the Arid Highlands and the different locations that I named. I just, you don't put a lot of effort into it because you don't, it's not worth what you get back out because what you have is going to grow on you anyway. And like I said, if it doesn't, if it's just not working, you can always change it up later. I feel like I've outroed about four times in this video, so we're not going to get uh, anything fancy. I really do appreciate everybody that stops by. Uh, all the like button stuff and all the subscribing, that definitely helps. But in the end, do what you need to do. Uh, I'm going to keep making these videos anyway. Uh, leave comments. Comments definitely improve the quality. But in the end, all of you guys just have an absolutely great day. And I'll see you next time around.